Hi, this is Rob. Welcome to the final video in our HTML tutorial series. In this video, we'll look at creating HTML forms. On the W3 school site, HTML forms has its own section. Starting with the form itself, an HTML form is used to collect user input, as I'm sure you know from accessing forms on the web. The user input is most often sent to a server for processing. So the form itself displays the input fields which the user interacts with and then when a user clicks the submit button it takes the data from the form and it sends it to the back end server to process the data. The form element is a semantic HTML element used to create a form and other elements are contained within the opening and closing form tag. HTML forms have attributes. HTML forms include form elements there are different input types for form elements and different attributes, some of which we will look at in this video. Looking at the browser, here we see a very simple form. It has three fields, one for a username and two related to the password. One to capture the password, which is displayed as hidden text, and one to confirm the password. There's a submit button that will submit the form when we click it, and in this case, it just reloads the page, and then a reset button which when clicked will reset the form to its default state when the page was loaded. In this case, the fields were empty, so this clears the fields. Jumping at the VS Code, we could see our main form element. Again, a semantic HTML element describing that the content wrapped within the opening closing tags is related to an HTML form. Inside of the form, we have label elements and input elements. So the first label we have has the text username, which is created for the HTML input element with the ID of username. What this allows is for the user to gain focus to the username field by either clicking into the field or clicking on the label. It's the connection between the for attribute in the label and the ID attribute in the input. As long as the value of the for and the value of the ID are the same, that connection will be made. To see that in action in the browser, I could either click into the username field to start typing, or into the password or confirm, or I could click the label for the username to have focus into the username field. The same for the password, and the same for the confirm. Another attribute I could add to an input field is the autofocus. If I save this and go back to the browser and reload the page, you'll see that the focus of the cursor is in the username field where I could just start typing right away. The two additional input types we have on our form are input type reset and input type submit. The value attribute specifies what the user sees on the input type. So in this case, the input type reset is a reset button, which when clicked will reset the state of the form to what it looked like when the page loads. And the user sees the word reset on the button. The input type submit submits the form when it's clicked. And in this case, the user will see submit on the button on the form. The reset button text, which is the value of the value attribute, and submit. Looking at the W3 Schools HTML form attributes page, we see that the action attribute, which can be applied to the form element, is used to define the action to be performed when the form is submitted. So when the user completes the form and clicks the submit button, where does that data go? In this case, in this example, the action when the form is submitted is to take the contents of the form and send it to an action underscore page dot PHP file on a web server. If you don't define an action inside of your form element, which was the case in our form declaration, when you submit the form, it simply reloads the current page. Another attribute for the HTML form is the method. And this specifies the method to be used when the form is submitted. So HTML methods can be get or post. And these refer to HTTP transactions. So to define the method, which is used when the form is submitted, we use the method attribute and set its value to get or post. As noted on this page, the get method appends the form data, what the user enters into the fields, into the URL as key value pairs. And that key value pair string 
is referred to as a query string. As noted, never use a get method to submit sensitive data. When you use the get method, all of the data that's input into the form is visible in the URL. So if you were entering a password, although the password itself isn't visible in the field on the form, when you submit the form with a get request, you would see the password in plain text. Whereas a post request takes the form data that the user entered and includes it inside of the body of the request, not inside of the URL or not in the query string. For this next example, I've created two new files. The first is form two HTML, which is a new page with a form. This form has an action attribute value of landing page HTML. That's the second new page I've created for this example. It just has a link back to the form two HTML file. So because landing page HTML is the value of the action attribute on the form, when the user submits the form, they're redirected to that page. And the value of the method attribute for the form is a get request. So when I complete all the fields in the form and click submit, because it's a get request, we should see the values that the user entered into the field in the URL, in the query string. If I go to the browser and I fill out the form and click submit, we're in fact redirected to the landing page and we can see that in the URL. Let me just copy this, and bring it back over to VS Code and paste it in so we could take a look. Okay, so if we look at the URL, we're on 127.001, port 5500, so that's running on live server. The page that we're on is landing page HTML, and that's followed by a question mark with key value pairs. The key value pairs are separated by the ampersand, and we have three of those. So what the question mark means is I'm appending a query string to the URL. So when we first came into this example, we were in index.html. But after we submitted the form, we landed on landing page HTML, and then we saw the query string, which comes after the question mark, appended to the URL for the landing page. What follows is the key value pair. So the name of the field, username one, so if we look up here at the input field, it has a name attribute, its value is username one. The value I typed in was foobar. And there's another key value pair, in the query string, that's user password one, that's the name attribute for this input field, and I typed in PWD for the password. And one final key value pair for user password confirm one, so if we go to the input field that has a name attribute with a value equal to user password confirm one, the value I typed in there was PWD. So the get sends the data that the user entered into the form fields in plain text. I just want to point out one thing in the input elements where I've given the element, in this case, an ID of username one and bound that to the username label using the for attribute on the label pointing to the value of username one. I've also given the input a name attribute equal to username one. Now the name attribute could be something different. It has no connection to the label. The for attribute in the label is bound to the input field based on the value of the ID. The value of the name attribute is what gets sent when we make the request for the form submission. So the username one, the user password one, and the user password confirm one are the values that we added to the name attributes. I just made them the same as the ID to be consistent in my naming for that particular input field. Another way to inspect the values which were passed in the form submission is to use the developer tools. So if I go back to the home page and I fill out the form, then I right click a blank area of the page and choose inspect and click on the network tab. When I submit the form, I'll see down here in the results that we went to landing page.html question mark username equals foobar and user password equals pwd right? and I'll see the entire query string. If I click in here I, I could get a more detailed view where in the HTML headers the request URL the page requested on form submission which is the value of the action attribute in the form was to landing page HTML. It appends the query string for the key value pairs of the, the form fields and data I entered. HTTP request method was a get. 
if I click on the payload, I can see the actual values that were appended to the query string. So it shows me the query string parameters where username one, a value of foobar, user password one, and user password confirmation one, which were both PWD. So let's go back to our homepage and go back to our code and let's look at an example of a form that has a method of post. So we'll collapse our current form and I'll add code for a new form. This one has an action of landing page HTML as well, but we've changed the method from a get to a post. We have the same fields for username, password, and confirmation. So when I submit this form after inputting the data, I'll still be redirected to landing page HTML, but because we're using a post and not a get, I won't see the query string. So if we save this and go back to the browser, here's our new form with the post. So I'll fill this out, submit the form, and now we can see the result of the request in the network tab. We just see landing page HTML with no query string appended. And if we look at the URL, there's no query string appended here either. If we come down into the actual payload, we'll see that we have form data listed now and not query string. We still have the key value pairs for the field names and what the user entered, but it's not as a query string. It's not in the URL. If we go to the headers, right, we'll see the request URL is to landing page HTML. The request type is a post. So this is the difference between using a method of get and a method of post when you create your forms in HTML. In the last example in this video, I'd like to take a look at a form which has multiple input types. If we look at the code on the left, we'll see the familiar label and input elements. Similar to our last forms, the input type for the username is text, which means the user can enter any characters into the field. This field also has the required attribute and autofocus. So as we've seen before, when the form loads, the element which has the autofocus attribute has the focus of the cursor. So I could just start typing into this field without having to click into it. That's due to autofocus. If I were to submit the form without entering a username, I'll get a message that tells me that I must fill out the field in order to submit the form. That's due to the required attribute. We've seen the user password and password confirmation fields in our prior examples, but these have an input type of password. So that means that when I type into the field, the characters are masked from display in the form. Both the password and the password confirmation fields are required. So if I submit the form after I populate the username, if I submit the form, I get a message in the password field that tells me that the length of the character must be at least eight characters. I didn't get a message saying that the field is required because I've already typed a value in. But if we go back and look at the code and the input type for the user password, in addition to the required attribute, we now have a min length attribute, which tells the browser the minimum length of the number of characters entered in the field must be eight. So if I go back and enter eight characters, now submit the form, the validation for the username and password field have passed, but I didn't enter anything into the confirmation field, so it's prompting me to enter a value because it's required and again, it must be at least eight characters. So I've entered the value in that field. Moving down in the form, we come to the address field. It is an input type text, so I could freeform text in there. It's not required, so I should be able to submit the form as is now because I've completed the username, password, and confirmation field, and the address field is not required. Nor is the city field, which is also an input type of text. The input type for the state is an HTML select element, and nested within the select element are HTML options. The options are what the user sees when they click on the select element. So if we go over to the form and click the select element, we see an abbreviated list of states. Now, if you look at the option tag, it's the text that comes between the opening and closing option tag that the user sees. However, the text which is assigned to the value of the particular option is what gets sent to the server when the user submits the form. Moving down to the zip code field, that's a text input field. Then we have the phone number, which is a type input of tell. So if I go to the phone field, and before I start typing in here, notice that 
it has a value in there already of 555-123-4567. That's not actual text. If I were to submit this form, that value would not be submitted. That's a placeholder text that we're using to prompt the user for the format of the phone number. And the format that we would like is defined in this pattern. So what's inside of these quotation marks is what's referred to as a regex, a regular expression. And the syntax reads, I'd like to have the values between zero and nine, so any number between zero and nine, for three characters. So that's my 555. Then I would like a dash, so I enter my dash. Then again, the characters zero through nine, so any number for three characters, one, two, three, another dash, and then four characters. If I do four, five, six, which is only three characters, and submit the form, I get a message to please match the requested format. And we had shown the requested format with the placeholder. So if I add a seven and submit, the phone number passes validation, but now I get a message to enter an email address. So if we look at the code, the input type for the email is an email type, and it's required. So if I were to come in and just type foo and submit, now I get a message indicating that this is an improper email address. So if I complete the email address, now this would pass validation. I'm not going to submit the form because I don't have required fields on any of the remaining inputs and I'd like to take a look at those. So moving down to the miscellaneous info, we have input types of radio. That means that I can select between these two radio buttons. The reason that I can toggle between these and not select both of them at the same time is due to the name attribute. When you have a collection of radio buttons that you want to be related, you set the value of the name attribute equal to the same value. So if I had multiple radio buttons on here and I wanted them bound together, as long as I give them all a name that's the same, I'll be able to select only one of those radio buttons. You'll notice in the second radio button for female, we have the checked attribute, which means that when the page loads, the female radio button is automatically selected. For the age, we have an input type of number with a minimum value of 18 and a max of 65. So if I were to come to the age field and type an A, it's not letting me enter that into the form. If I type a zero, it will let me enter that but if I submit, it'll tell me the value must be greater than or equal to 18. So if I do 99 and submit, now the value must be less than or equal to 65 because that's the range. Because this is a number, I can use the up and down arrows to select the value, or I could just come in and type the actual value that I want. The contact me input type is a checkbox. It has a value of yes. That's the value that would be submitted when I complete the form and click the submit button. For a checkbox, if I don't select the value, if it's unchecked and I submit the form, this field will not be sent to the server. So for a checkbox, if this particular checkbox is checked, the form submission will contain a key value pair with a name contact and a value of yes. If it's unchecked when the form submits, there is no key for the contact field. Finally, the last form element we'll look at is a text area. This has an attribute of rows, which tells me how many rows I want to display for the text area, and cows, how many columns. So if I resize this, we have four rows displayed and 50 columns. And I could type anything into this field that I want. If I change this to 10 rows and 75 columns and refresh, we see that the box has gotten bigger. So that's how we control the size of the text area input field. And those are just some of the form input fields that you can use when you build your HTML forms. I would encourage you to go out to the W3 School site, look up forms and form inputs, and play around with them. Add some to your form and use the required attribute, the placeholder attribute, the pattern attribute, and just gain some experience in building HTML forms. So that concludes this HTML tutorial playlist. Thanks for sticking with me through it. I hope you learned a lot, and I also hope to see you in the next playlist, which will be a CSS tutorial series.